Hi, it's Andy, and welcome to the Hills Church Podcast. Our hope is that this will help your life and inspire your faith. Thanks again for checking us out. Oh, it's so good to see you. Uh, I can't see you, you know. It's awesome. You doing well? Now, listen, I, as, as, uh, as Andy mentioned, I grew up in Northern Ireland, uh, and so 31 years ago, the Lord took me to America. He knew America needed help, and so we looked to the Irish to help him. Come on. Right? <laughs> and so, so this is Aaron's first time here, and I told him yesterday, I said, or I told him this morning, I said, you know, the Northwest, it's always sunny like this. 300 days a year, right? It's like and so this. always like this. It never rains here. Th- 300 days of sunshine a year, you know? So uh, uh, if it does rain, I don't know, it must have been Aaron that brought it with him or something, you know? But uh, man, it is so great to be with you guys this morning, and uh, I'm just privileged to be back home, and, uh, and it really is home for me. Uh, I have, uh, I've been spying on you for about 18 months. I know that might, Andy said that feels a little weird when, you, when I told him that this morning, but I meant it as a compliment uh, because I recognize that God is up to something special in the Northwest. God is up to something special through you as a people. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you are part of a miracle story. And I just even felt this morning that, you know, as I'm walking around the building and I'm hearing stories and, and just recognizing that there's been miracle after miracle that has brought you as a community of people to this place, to this space, to this time for God's purpose, for God's glory. He's got some special things in store, doesn't he? And, uh, <coughs> ah, it's time to change. Sorry. Time to change. So I'll just mute this one, put it in my back pocket, and I'll have two mics. Now I look really important. <laughs> I actually feel presidential at this point. <laughs> President always has a couple of microphones, so it's important to have a couple of microphones. So anyway, but I, I just recognize, and, and I hope you recognize, that you are part of a miracle story, that, that there are miracles that have taken place. And I, I just feel so deeply in my heart, uh, forgive me, I'm going deep pretty quick, but I just feel so deeply in my heart that there are some open doors, there are some miracle things, and, and what might feel like a small beginning there's some amazing things that God has in store for you as a church family. And I want to just stir you and encourage you this morning that I think there's a story. I think there's some amazing, miraculous things that are going to happen in the next season here in this city, in this region. But I think there's some miracle things that are going to happen on this island and even this continent that you're going to be a part of. And, uh, and I'm just so privileged to be here. God's given you guys some amazing pastors, hasn't he? And uh, I'm just getting to know these guys. And uh, they're amazing leaders. And I'm just so privileged to be a part and uh, to kind of get to know you guys. And uh, we're on the, we're going to become, I feel really quickly, hearts connected, fast friends. This is going to go deep, you know. And so I'm just so privileged to be here. So a uh, little bit about me. Uh, born and raised in McGabry, Northern Ireland. And uh, I was 18 and I uh, felt like I was supposed to go to Bible college. Uh, and so uh, I ended up looking at some Bible colleges. And, and as Andy said, Desi Watt ended up, he was in my church, and he's like, yeah, there's this college in Portland, you got to go there, and uh, that's how I ended up there. So that was 31 years ago, and uh, I met uh, Love of My Life. In fact, I think I have a picture of my family uh, that you guys can look at. I don't know if, there we are, look at that. That's my family, my wife on the, the left there, her name's Jenny, and uh, she's so sad she couldn't be here, but she was in the Middle East with my daughter, uh, who's in the Middle East uh, right now studying, and uh, so she was there for a couple of weeks and got home right before I left. You know, so, uh, so we haven't seen each other, actually, but far three, a few days in the last month. But uh, my, my wife, Jenny, we've been married 27 years. I have three kids, uh, Aiden there in the middle. He's uh, 23. Uh, he's a, he went to Bible college and then decided to go do his master's in fashion design in New York City. Because that's what you do, right? And so, so he's a fashion designer working in New York City, studying there. Uh, and then uh, my daughter on the, next to my wife, that's Sophie. She's 21. She's in the Middle East. Uh, she speaks fluent Arabic and uh, studying Middle Eastern studies, and it just feels like God has called her to the Middle East. So she's giving herself to the call of God in her life, and we don't know where that's going to take her, what that's going to do, uh, but I just love that she's pursuing Jesus. And then my youngest is Mads. She's 18. She's in Portland, but I never see her. She's at college. She only comes home on the weekends to do, do her laundry, you know, so. But uh, that's our family, and uh, man, we've been, like I said, in Portland for about 31 years and uh, pastoring there and uh, been an absolute privilege uh, to just uh, be there. But I've been asking myself for years, Lord, what does it look like to come back here? 
Lord, what, what, how can we serve? How can we learn? How can we partner? How can, because there's things that you're, te- you've been here this week, and there's just so much that I've learned, and I've been taught just as I've been around folks here. And uh, so I'm just thrilled that we've been able to connect, because the kingdom of God moves at the speed of relationship, doesn't it? Because it's all about relationship. We are connected to a relational God. And, and I want to spend a little bit of time just kind of joining you in what you've been doing over the last few weeks. I think you've been in a little series on uh, the life of David. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, how many of you have been enjoying that series? Yeah. I took some time to uh, listen along. Uh, like I told you, I'm spying on you. <laughs> right? And so I took a little time just to kind of listen along too. But I want to I dive in this morning. i got a few minutes. And I want to dive in uh, to just take a look at the life of David and a particular aspect of the life of David that deals with relationships. How many of you know relationships are important, aren't they? You know, not one of us was designed to be a loner. And when we recognize that God is a relational God, God wants to be in relationship with us, but he also wants us to be in relationship with each other. And I so appreciate what Pastor Andy said earlier, that that we're recognizing that we live out of a kingdom story. The world lives out of a selfish story, a, the, 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 a worldly story, a story that has self at the center. But we don't live out of that story as followers of Jesus. We live out of a kingdom story. And so we live and follow and want to live the way God wants us to live. And so we recognize that relationships are core, they're central to living out that particular story. But, but of course, we do that in a context, in a world which really thrives or really drives towards isolation. Right? It's about me at the center. It's about, you know, uh, as, as, as Andy was saying earlier, you know, and I don't think that's just a, a Northwest, uh, Northern Ireland thing. You know, I think that's a world thing, you know, where it's like, man, I don't need anybody's help. I'm going to figure this out on my own, you know. And, and even our culture, when you think about, you know, Netflix, when you think about podcasts, when you think about your phone, you think about Instagram, everything's driving us towards isolation. Everything's driving us to these places where it's just about me, myself, and I. I'll figure it out myself. I'll just make it through on my own. But the kingdom of God, the story of God, the story that you and I are living out is a story that involves other people. And it's by design. It's the way God created us to be. And so this morning, I just want to pull three points out of the life of David. And the first thing is, you know, the thing that I love about David is if if God can use David... God can use every one of us, can he? I mean, here's a man that, man, you know, there's some highlights in his life, right? There's some really amazing things that took place in his life, but there's also some really low times, right? I mean, he committed adultery. He had the husband murdered, right? There's some things that you just go, man, I don't think he's a good guy. But God looked at him through a certain lens, and God made a covenant with him because God had a purpose for his life. God had a plan. God wanted to involve him in the story of God. And what we're going to discover this morning is that it's all about relationship. Relationship is what moves the kingdom of God forward. It's what moves us forward as we, uh, as we root ourselves in relationship with God and relationship with one another. And so often when we look at the life of David, we think of, you know, when we think about relationships in the life of David, we think about the relationship between Jonathan and David. How many would be familiar with that story, you know? Jonathan gave, gives his life to serve David, and in fact, Jonathan ends up getting killed, you know, and David ends up going on becoming king. Uh, and, and we recognize that there's this unique relationship that exists between Jonathan and David. But there's something beyond, there's something beneath, there's something that was foundational. And before we can talk about the relationships that exist between each other, we have to recognize that there's a relationship that God wants to have with us. In fact, what we, what we recognize from the life of David is that the, the success that David had, the beauty of this relationship that existed between Jonathan and David, was actually rooted in the relationship that David had with his God. And we need to understand that if we're going to be those who live out God's story, who, who relate to one another on that kind of a level where, man, we're all in on each other. We've got our, each other's back. We're all in on the community that we live in. We're all in on this nation. We're all in on wanting to see the kingdom purpose of God uh, happen in this place. We've got to recognize that where that place starts is recognizing the relationship, the covenant that we have with God. Or maybe a better way of saying it is that the covenant that God has to us. And so every relationship, I think every kingdom relationship, its start is that God relates to us, just like he did to David, on the basis of covenant. When you look at the life of David, David says, I'm going to build you a house. And God actually says, no, 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 you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. 
And what he's effectively trying to communicate to David is, I'm all in on you, David. Now, that ought to provide some comfort for us because we know the rest of the story. We know how David stumbled. We know how David fell. Any of you ever sinned? Come on, we're in church. We can be honest, right? I sin. I struggle, right? And, but, but to recognize that covenant is this idea that God is all in on us. God was all in on David. And, you know, most of our life, and, and this word covenant isn't a term that we use that often, you know, but our life, most of your life is dictated by contracts. How many of you have a mobile phone bill, right? You have some sort of contract, right? How many of you have a mortgage, a car payment, right? And they're all based on contracts. And a contract is this idea that if you do this, I'll do that. Now, I've become very American uh, because, you know, as, as Irish, we don't, we don't complain a lot. You know, we don't, well, we do, but just not to maybe the people that, you know, have caused us some problems. But, <clears throat> but, but I, as an American, you know, it's like, man, if there's something out of line, I'm on the phone. I want that fixed, you know. And that's the nature of a contract, isn't it? That if you do this, I'll do that. Now, you notice in my example, I didn't use the example of marriage. Can you imagine if marriage was a contract? You know, I'll make the dinner, well, but only if you mow the lawn, right? Well, I'm only going to mow the lawn if you do the laundry, right? You see, marriage isn't a contract, right? It's a covenant. Till death do us part, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, and what marriage, that marriage covenant communicates to us is that we are all in on each other. Regardless of whether it's good or bad, regardless of whether we're healthy or not, we're all in on each other. And that's the kind of relationship that God wants to initiate, God wants to sustain, God wants to have with each one of us. To recognize that God is all in on you. Like even on your worst day, even when you think, man, I've stumbled, I've failed, I've messed up one more time, God doesn't change. He's all in on you. In fact, look at these verses, 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Isn't that a powerful verse? That even on your worst day, you know, even when you've like kicked the cat, right, you know, like I just, I'm having my really bad day, on your worst day, God is still all in on you. Look at this, Romans 8.30. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Look at this, J uh, Jude 1.24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory and great joy. God is all in on you. God's pushed all the chips in on the middle of the table. And even though we stumble, even though we fall, even though we mess up, even though we don't get it right, just like David, God says, no, 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 I'm all in on you. I'm all in on you. Why? Because God so deeply desires relationship with each one of us. God so deeply wants to come alongside, to walk by you, that when things are good, when things are bad, you have an ever-present help in time of need. Because God's not a formula. God's not an idea. God's a person that loves you, that cares for you, that wants to walk with you. And so we recognize that in the life of David, the foundation to every other relationship, to this relationship that we'll look at just now uh, around David and Jonathan, everything was rooted and grounded in the fact that, that it was about his covenant, his relationship with him. And if you walk out of here with nothing else this morning, Please walk out of here knowing that there's a God, not just in heaven, but there's a God beside you who walks with you, who is all in on you. So we recognize that, that the foundation to every relationship, the foundation to living this kind of life is to understand clearly who God is and how God wants to relate to you. The second thing I think we learned from David's life is this, is that God's covenant with David actually became the source of his life. If God's always the initiator, we're always the responder. Always. You know, when you read that passage in Hebrews chapter 11, it's known as the great chapter of faith. And it's all this story about Noah and Moses and all these, you know, wonderful Bible characters, you know, who did all these amazing things for God. 
And not one of them did they initiate anything. It was God who always initiated. They always responded. And so God initiates this covenant to say, I'm all in on you. But David recognizes that that connection with God is the source now of his life. And that, that he, to be, for God to be all in on him, man, I'm going to push all my chips in on the table. In fact, David, we look at this, and in fact, uh, Pastor Andy said this in week one, is that God looks at the heart, right? But when God looks at the heart, the heart, and we engage God that way through Jesus, what we recognize is that it produces a response in us. And this is what we notice, like in Psalm 119, David, we're talking about this character, David, and learning from his life, it says that he meditated on God's ways day and night. We recognize in, in 2 Samuel 11 that, man, yes, he had stumbled, yes, he had fallen, but because God had created a way, he, he responded by repenting. He responded by realigning his life with God. And so even when you go throughout the Psalms, you recognize that David doesn't deny the reality of the difficulty of life that he's living in, but he acknowledges the greatness of God in it. His heart was oriented to God. And really what we recognize, there's a little word actually, in fact, it, it says this in Psalm 42, 1, as the deer pants for the streams of water, my soul pants for you, O God. And this is David writing this psalm. David's recognizing, man, God, you, you've made this covenant with me. You're all in. And because I've learned about, recognize how much you care for me, how much you love me, that God, David's response is now to say, man, just like the deer, and, and by the way, this picture of a deer, man, man, it's like thirsting, it's panting, it's going after. It desperately needs that. And this is the attitude of David's heart. Look at that little word, my soul pants for you, O oh God. Let me ask you a question this morning. How's your soul? How's your connection to God? God's all in on you. But how's your connection to God? There's a little verse found in 3 John chapter, or there's only one chapter, but it's 3 John 2. And he says this, may it go well for you as it goes, and may you be in good health as it goes well for your soul. Man, what does that, what does that mean? You know, so often we give attention to all the outward things of life, you know, all the cares of this world, maybe our finances and, and certain things going on. But we pay attention, you know, uh, some of you, you know, I just met Joel this morning here and he's, he's working out all the time. Joel, right? <laughs> Joel's working out all the time and uh, made me feel bad this morning when I got in the car, you know. I think about working out all the time, but that's about it. And not, not picking on Joel because I know Joel works on the inside as well, right? Because he's a good and godly man. But, but so many of us work on the outside. But God's actually saying, hey, how's your soul? How's the inside doing in terms of its connection to God? You see, the soul, you know, what is, the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? And, and we have to ask ourselves the question, well, what is your soul? What, what does that mean? What's that connection? And, and your soul is this part of you that's connected to the source of life. In fact, the, the Hebrew word and the Greek word for soul is the same word for breathe or breath. And you know, there's this interesting story. If you go back to the start of the Bible, God creates Adam and Eve, right? And it's told in Genesis 1 26. In fact, there's this pattern in the, in the creation story where for six days, or for five days, God goes, let it be, let it be, let it be. Like he says, he speaks and things get created. But then he's going to create mankind. And you know, the language changes. He doesn't say, let it be. He says, no, 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 let us make. And there's this idea that God, that the words that are used there, it's this idea that God is handcrafting humanity. Do you know that you're handcrafted? Do you know that God has personally designed, put you together? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. This is what it's saying in the Genesis story, right? That, that you're fearfully, you're handcrafted by God for a specific purpose. But it's so interesting when you go into chapter 2, it says that he formed the man, but it wasn't until he breathed into him that he came to life. And there's this idea that it's breath, it's the very life of God in us that actually brings life to our being. That your soul is that part of you that's connected 
to God. And so the question this morning is, man, yeah, God's all in on me, but do you recognize that you're handcrafted and God wants the source of your life to be him completely? How do you reorient your life around that? In fact, David actually said it this way later in Psalm 103, blessed be the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. God wants us to live from that place of connection with him. And it's out of these, I, I think these kind of two pieces of the platform, that then we can begin to learn to live in relationship to one another. Now once again, every human being, it's not just you, but every human being lives with this idea, man, I don't need anybody else's help. I, I got this on my own. And maybe that's because, man, we're embarrassed. Maybe that's because, you know, nah, I got it, pride, whatever it might be. But one of the things that we learned from David's life is that David needed covenant friends. He understood that he couldn't do it by himself. In fact, I love this verse that really describes the relationship between Jonathan and David. Psalm Samuel, 1 Samuel 18 says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And from that day, Saul kept David with him and didn't let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant. There's that word again. He's all in with David because he loved him as himself. We need people in our lives to be the hands and feet of Jesus. In fact, you are the hands and feet of Jesus in the lives of some other people. And we, re we need to recognize that, man, we can't do life on our own. Now, here's what's so amazing about the story of Jonathan and David. There couldn't have been two more polar opposite people. David, when, when Jonathan met David, Jonathan was probably around the age of 28. David was about the age of 18. Remember, Jonathan was the prince. He was the son of the king. He grew up in a palace. He learned the art of war. David, man, he's a shepherd. He's out in the fields herding sheep, right? Like he's a nobody. And we recognize that there's, there's two people that couldn't have been any more opposite, but God brings them together. You know what? That's what God always does. In fact, I guarantee you, you look around the room. All of us have some different backgrounds. And that's what God does. God brings people together who are maybe the polar opposites. Maybe they have very little in common. You look at the life of the disciples. You know, Jesus puts a tax collector, right, the most hated man in, the, in Israel, together with a zealot who actually wants to kill him. Right? And he puts them together. And that's what Jesus does because when we're all in, when God's all in on us and we're all in on him, that allows us to come together in covenantal ways. And this is exactly what God, I believe, wants to do in us. That God wants to push us together. God wants us to be involved in each other's lives. God wants us to lay our lives down for one another. In fact, I love this verse out of Hebrews 10. It says this, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. There's God's covenant. And let us consider that we may spur one another on to love and good, good deeds, not giving up meeting together. That God's actually put us together. God has actually brought you and I into this place to strengthen one another, to encourage one another, in fact, to lay down our lives for one another. Now, we live, do I have those sticks? We live in a broken world, don't we? And I was thinking about this this week. I went to, I went to home base and bought myself a little illustration. But <clears throat> we live in a pretty broken world, don't we? We live in a world with a whole lot of pressure. You know, there's financial pressure, there's relational pressure, spiritual pressure, right? Raising the kids, dealing with that stuff at work. And the pressure can build and build and build and build. And oftentimes what happens living in the world in which we live, we break, don't we? But here's what the Lord does. The Lord says, I'm all in on you, and I'm putting you together with a community of believers and that community of believers, man, when you're added one to another, oh boy, no, we're good. But when you're added one to another, what begins to happen? Forgive the noise. Oh, you got it? What begins to happen? I'm not going to break it. I'm not that strong. <laughs> right? But when the Lord adds us one to another, we recognize, man, there's greater strength. And you recognize, man, when I'm out on my own, 
man, I'm going to feel some pressure. I'm going to feel the pressure of that. I'm going to be broken by some of those things. But the Lord says, no, no, no. You're not designed to live on your own. I've added you with John and with Susie. and with, I've added you to Hills Church. I brought you into a community of believers. And yeah, you walk from all kinds of different sides of life. You know, and One might be a prince. One might be a shepherd. One might be one who understands the art of war. The other one might be one that just, man, I'm just a shepherd. Who am I? I'm a nobody. But the Lord brings you into a community. He loves you. He says, I'm all in on you. And I don't want you just to be all in on me. I want you to be all in on each other. Because as you're all in on each other, there's great strength that comes. And this is what God's calling us to. Thank you. God is calling us to be a body of believers that strengthen one another. And as I close this morning, I want, to, I want you to consider the relationships that you have in your life. I want you to ask yourself, number one, man, do I recognize that God is all in on me? Man, some of you might be sitting in the room here this morning, you know, and maybe, maybe you even grew up in church. You know, maybe you've never been around church. You know, maybe church was something that's a distant memory. But maybe you haven't recognized that, man, God is all in on you. In fact, you might be sitting here by God's design just to hear me say that. That in spite of you, in spite of your circumstance, in spite of the stumbling, in spite of the failing. In fact, this is what I love about Hills Church. Man, we don't stand here like, man, we got it all figured out. No, we're a community of imperfect people trying to figure this whole thing out. And so God's brought you in this morning just to hear you hear, so that you can hear him say to you, I'm all in on you. I love you. I, want, I gave my life to you through Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you this morning, man, as we close this morning, I want you to consider, man, where is that? Do I see God that way? Or do I see God with some big stick up in the heavens ready to whack me upside the head? No, no, no. God is all in on you through Jesus Christ. But how's your heart? How's your soul? How's your relationship with him? And maybe there's some adjustments. Maybe, man, I've been walking with Jesus. I've been, and this has been my life, you know, man. I got it. I, I attend church and I, I do all the right things. But, man, there's just something empty inside. And I think the Lord is saying to you this morning, come on a little closer. The Bible says, draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. How's your soul? May it go well for you as it goes well for your soul. And there's this idea that God's just inviting you to connect with him at a deeper level. Man, that might start with just some more worship. That might start with, man, I'm going to wake up to some tomorrow morning, and you know my first thought, not to pick up my phone, maybe not even to go grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. No, my first thought tomorrow morning is, Lord, I'm surrendering my life. I'm surrendering my heart. I'm surrendering my day. I'm surrendering my purpose. I'm surrendering my will. I'm surrendering my plans to your plans because I want to be connected with you. And the last thing this morning as I close is I want you to think about maybe the relationships that you have that are horizontal. You know, the Bible, there's a couple of, in the New Testament, there's a couple of relationships that I think every single one of us should have in our lives. And the first one is Paul. You remember the Apostle Paul. Paul was a mentor to other people. You should have somebody in your life that can be a mentor to you. Somebody who can encourage and strengthen and challenge you maybe a little bit. Challenge your thinking. Encourage you to take another step. Go a little bit further in the Lord. And so I want to ask you, who is it in your life that you're relating to? You might be in a small group already, and you, man, I got it. I know who that person is in my life. But there might be others in the room this morning that you're going, man, I don't know who that is. I know that the team here is going to help each one of us figure out, man, who, who's helping me take my next step? But, but in addition to that, we all need encouragers. I had a, I had, my dad was just a, a fantastic, I grew up playing rugby. My dad was just a fantastic encourager. He'd show up at every one of my games. In fact, silly story, but I scored a try. And, um, you know, it was a special moment for me because I don't score tries that often, you know. Put the ball down and I turned around and my dad's laying in the mud. Because he's running down the sideline and has tripped over somebody because he's an encourager. We all need encouragers in our life, don't we? We live in a world that just eats away at our faith, eats away at, at positivity. Man, we live in a world that just piles on negativity, but that's not how God works. God surrounds you with people that build you up, that encourage you, that strengthen you, that pour into you. So who are those that are encouraging you? 
Let me turn it around. Who are you encouraging? And that's really the, the third relationship that we see in the New Testament, which is a Timothy. Who are you pouring yourself into? Who are you giving yourself to? We all need, and that might be somebody that's sitting next to you. That might be somebody that's sitting in this room. I hope that there are people outside of the walls of this building that, man, you're pouring yourself into. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe they're far away from Jesus. In fact, there's this beautiful story of Philip who, who was a disciple of Jesus. Jesus calls Philip to come follow him. And Philip says, hold on a minute. i got to go get my friend Nathaniel. And he goes and gets Nathaniel, and Nathaniel's like, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. I'm not going to, and Jesus who? I'm not going to follow him. And Philip won't let him go. Philip says, no, 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 you got to come, you got to come, you got to come. And he ends up, Nathaniel ends up following Jesus. Because Philip, like Timothy, chose to be the kind of person that I'm not going to go on this on my own. I'm going to bring somebody with me. And, I, and, and it can be as simple as an invitation as Victoria was saying to us earlier. But I want to ask you this morning, where are you at with your relationships? And so would you do me a favor? Would you mind just closing your eyes? And just, I just want you to, just a moment of privacy. I believe that, man, I, I hope that I'm not just speaking some words. I believe that the word of God is active. I believe that you're part of a miracle story. I believe that even now God wants to speak to you. God wants to challenge you. And God's always the initiator and creates opportunities for us to respond. And this morning, maybe, just maybe, there's someone in the room, and man, I've never seen it like that before. I've never understood that, that God would actually be all in on me. That God, there's no way, there's no way God could love me. There's no way God could love me. And yet God would send his son to leave the majesty and the splendor of heaven to live the life that you and I couldn't live, wouldn't live, will never live. And then willingly go to the cross, take the penalty and the payment for our sin so that we could have relationship, so that we could enter in. There's no greater sign of God's love. Man, if that's you this morning, I just want to give an opportunity for you just to say, Lord, I want that. I want that relationship. It might be bold, it might be brave, but man, every eye's closed. No one's looking around, but man, would you be willing just to even raise your hand and say, man, I want that relationship with Jesus. I want to take that step. Thank you. Thank you. So Lord Jesus, we recognize this morning that because of your great sacrifice on the cross, because of your great love for us, God so loved the world. He so loved people that he gave his only begotten son. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that it's as simple as, Lord, I confess my sin. And, Lord, I accept that sacrifice, that relationship with you. And so, Jesus, for all of us this morning in this room, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would help us to be those that are in covenant with you, but, Lord, also in covenant with one another. So, Lord, we honor you. We bless you this morning. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Hey, thanks again for checking out the Hills Church podcast. Hey, if this message has inspired or encouraged you in any way, why don't you share it with a friend? Hey, as well as that, we meet every Sunday at 11 a.m. at the Waterside Theatre, and we'd love to see you at one of our services. But hey, thanks again for checking out the podcast. Why don't you subscribe to our channel?